Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Professor Bigger. One person a week. Should we try that again? Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Thank you. Good morning. <laughs> I only know good morning. I only know one language, I'm afraid. Um, Thank you very much, Bert, for organising this and inviting me to be sandwiched between two Chris's. Um, it's an interesting place to be. Um, and thank you very much, Ted, for all your excellent work in making this happen. In true academic fashion, I'm going to sort of deviate from this title and essentially talk about what I want to talk about. I'm going to talk about a little bit of background first, and then we're going to talk about the transient wind simulator. I'm going to present some results in terms of velocity field and some measurements that we've undertaken on a low, medium and high rise building. And I'll talk about what makes them low, medium and high rise if I remember and if we have the time. <coughs> so this represents some work that both Chris and I did going back to 2007 where we looked at a series of anemometer records around Europe and we extracted extreme events and what you're looking at on the vertical axis is the wind speed in normalized form and on the horizontal axis in time expressed in seconds and as you can see we have significant variations in wind speed over a rel relatively short period of time what caused this, these variations we don't know because we only have this wind speed record but you can see a massive acceleration or a large acceleration peak followed by a reasonably short deceleration. Now when most people think of non-stationary winds or transient events, they think of the, the now iconic or idealized Fujita models. The microburst, which tends to represent the thunderstorm, where we have a downward column of air coming vertically downwards, impinging on the ground, resulting in a ring vortex that spreads outward from the impingement center and we have some kind of model that represents a tornado where you have wind flowing around the centre and then the closer you get to the core they go vertically upwards. If we just look at tornadoes for a very brief moment and I'll just show a slide that I borrowed from a colleague just from last week, Corinne Hangen, presented this and what, we, what we're looking at here is tangential wind speed on the vertical axis and distance from the core on the horizontal axis. The data points represent measurements made at full scale and the lines represent measurements made in a, an idealized, I won't call it wind tunnel, I'll call it a simulator, a tornado generator. And what we find that for tornadoes is that we have these very very simplized forms where if we non-dimensionalize them they, for, they form or they can be modelled, rather, by a Rankine vortex. Very idealised flow. And that's something that we're going to go on and simulate in Birmingham. But what I want to really talk about are downburst type winds. And I use that phrase downburst type specifically because, as we've seen from Giovanni, no downbursts are the same. You've already seen this picture once this morning. Although what I've done is I've flipped it around because normally we, we look at time going along on the horizontal axis. And this is the, the now famous, I think, record that was taken from the Andrews Air Force Base in America. From an anemometer that was 3.9 metres above the ground. And as you can see, we have a period of relatively low wind speed. Then all of a sudden we had a rapid increase in velocity, followed by a decrease, followed by another increase later. The first increase resulted as the initial rolled vortex passed over the anemometer and the back increase, so this back point here, was as the second vortex which was spreading out, so this one at the end, rolled over the anemometer. <coughs> and I have to admit here that one of my shortcomings is when I saw this, for a long time I thought, that's what a downburst looks like. So that stuck in my mind, I think, for at least a year, that that is a downburst. And then I was educated by looking at figures collected from a colleague, Frank Lombardo at Texas Tech. And what you're looking at here, again, is wind speeds on the vertical direction, time on the horizontal. And if you don't take anything else away from this presentation, what I'd like you to take away is the fact that all downbursts are unique. There is no one single downburst that we can say that is representative of what we mean by a thunderstorm microburst or a thunderstorm downburst. 
as Giovanni has also illustrated. So when you go about trying to simulate these events, it's actually very difficult, because what is it that we're trying to simulate? So we decided actually, well, what we're trying to simulate, really, are these rapid increases in velocity, followed by some kind of decrease at the end. So how did we go about doing this? Well, actually, very simple. We got a series of nine axial flow fans. We pointed them vertically downwards towards the ground. We switched them on, then all of a sudden, when we were ready, we said, actually, we're going to release some doors. We had a series of doors here, <coughs> and those doors moved away, and that allowed us to have a column of air that impinged on the ground and spread outwards. <coughs> we built a false floor so we could actually put the model in, and we'll look at that in more detail. Once, we, the, once we'd released the flaps, we also turned the fans off, so we didn't have a constant pulse of air. The next figures illustrate essentially what we are trying to simulate. So we start at the top left. On the edge here, you can see the edge of the simulator. <coughs> and what these white particles represent are non-nuclearly buoyant particles, but they're sufficient for what we want to illustrate, flowing vertically down over. The generator hasn't been switched on yet. And we've got some particles on the ground there. If we just move across here, we've now switched the generator on. A shear layer is starting to develop between the air at the side of the generator and the air flowing down. So the particles start to wrap around. A few seconds later, you see that we have this rather large roll vortex formed. And this is just before it hits the ground. We can tell that because these particles haven't started to move yet. A few seconds later, this vortex hits the ground, accelerates, reduces in size, the vorticity increases. As we move along, the vortex actually gets bigger, and then it dissipates as it moves outwards. And one thing, just to take over home from this final figure, is if you look here and look at the wavy pattern, the vortex isn't spreading out uniformly. And if we repeat this again and again and again, it goes out differently. So, in terms of the, the streamwise or the radial velocity, if we plotted that with, with height above the ground, we'd expect to get this idealized no-shaped profile, which Giovanni has already demonstrated. And bear in mind that looks very different to a conventional boundary layer profile. So one of the questions we asked ourselves is, well, what does the corresponding flow field look like as a result of that no-shaped profile? And then the next question is, how does that then relate to pressures and forces on buildings? <clears throat> Our actual measurements are demonstrated by this line here. And what we've also got on that figure are measurements taken in full scale. So as you see, we've got quite a large variation from here to here of actual full scale events. And again, that's not too surprising because each microburst, each transient wind is very different. And I should say that these, these have been normalized such that one represents the height above the ground at which the maximum velocity occurs, and one on the horizontal axis represents the velocity normalized by the maximum velocity. Should they, they should all pass through that point. Bearing in mind each event is different, how do we go about trying to get an understanding of what an average, an average in inverted commas, event might look like? Well, we built ensemble means. We repeated the runs 10 times, we added them all together in order to look at what, may, what the actual field, the velocity field, may look like. So that's fine for the streamlined velocity. And if we try and overlay that with what we had at Texas Tech, sorry, Andrews Air Force Base, the red line is what you saw before, and the blue line is actually what we're generating. Not too bad, I don't think, in terms of capturing the acceleration, deceleration phase. We weren't too bothered about what was happening at this end here. So moving on, how does the actual streamwise velocity and the vertical velocity relate to one another? So these, what you're looking at here are phase plots, instantaneous velocities of streamwise velocity or radial velocity on the horizontal axis, vertical velocity on the vertical axis. 
The green line represents the height at a certain distance on a small distance above the ground. The blue line represents the same distance from the centre of impingement but a factor of 10 above the ground. And as you can see that we've got very little vertical motion when you're close to the ground but as you move away you've got significant vertical motion upwards and downwards representing the main ring vortex as it passes over. So if we fix the, the height above the ground, and the, sorry, if we fix the distance and change the height above the ground, we can say actually it's quite messy. So as you move away from the ground, the vertical velocity and the horizontal velocity are doing very different things. <clears throat> so we then asked ourselves a question, and again this touches on something that Giovanni mentioned, how do we calculate something like the turbulence intensity? This is a parameter that we're all familiar, familiar with and that we all use in our everyday life to sort of quantify flows. So in order to, to calculate turbulence intensity, we need, to, we need to know what the mean is. What is the mean for a velocity time series that looks like that? Well, we did it slightly different to Giovanni in the sense that we, well, I think we did it slightly different to Giovanni in the sense that we decompose a signal by using wavelet analysis. And we did that in order to, to reach a point at which the, what, what remained, the residual signal, was stationary. And we found that if we decompose that into nine levels, we could end up with a residual signal. We can then reconstruct our time series, so that's the original. Our reconstruction, we can overlay, which looks reasonably good. And we're left with a time series around about that, which is our turbulence intensity. And what we've noticed is that no matter which records we apply this to, the turbulence intensity, when defined in this way, tends to be a lot smaller. For this record, it was 5%. We've got up to 10%, but no more. So if we move on now and have a look at the wind forces that we've measured on buildings, two types of buildings here. One is a simple rectangular structure. One is a portal frame structure. The black holes represent pressure taps. Just to give you an idea of the number of pressure taps we were dealing with. We were particularly bothered about what was happening over the roof. So each of those holes were connected to a wire which was then connected to a pressure transducer. So if you look at what happens underneath, it looks something like that. One of those things that you think, that's a good idea, and you send your PhD student off to do it because you don't want to do it yourself. Um, well, that's what I did, and it seemed to work out. So, <clears throat> we've got a few figures here. A number of things are happening on this figure, so it's quite complex. The wind is coming from the bottom. So this is an expanded view of the building and represents contours of pressure. <coughs> the, the figure at the top right is the pressure measured from a ground tapping immediately upstream of the building, whereas the figure on the bottom right represents what's happening with the streamwise velocity. And as, as we step through time, this blue line will move along a bit. So if we just play that for a little bit, and then I stop it there, you can see that the ground plane pressure has suddenly dived down. That means that the vortex is passing over the pressure tap upstream. If we repeat that, you'll see very closely, well, you'll see what happens yourself. Because I like these things, I'll just play this one all the way through from the start. The difference between this and the previous one is the floor is coming at 90 degrees, not 45 degrees. <clears throat> so you can see that we're getting the same kind of behaviour as, as what we would expect in an atmospheric boundary layout wind. In other words, flow leading to a, a reduced pressure coefficient there. And if we run this one again, we'll see around here points of negative pressure or maximum negative pressure, as you would expect in a normal atmospheric boundary layer wind where your delta wing vortices occur. <coughs> so what we were particularly interested in was, well we've got these buildings, how do we scale these buildings? How would you normally go about scaling buildings in atmospheric boundary layer floor? This is a question, I hate standing up here and talking by myself. How, Answers us, please. How would you normally go about scaling buildings atmospheric boundary layer flow? I'm not going to ask Professor Baker because you know. 
I might ask the gentleman waving his card telling me to shut up. Come on, there must be someone. Help me out and Professor Baker. Jensen number. Jensen number. Can we use that in the current in the current approach? Can we use it in the current approach? No, we can't. Well, <laughs> because we don't have we have no idea what the surface roughness is like in terms of quantifying that in terms of the Jensen number. We have no idea what the boundary layer height is. So what we try to do is have a look at what happens when you have a, vo when you have a building which is a different height relative to the size of the vortex. We couldn't change our vortex, but what we could change is our building size. So essentially we took a building and we slowly moved it down into the floor. And what you're looking at here is essentially the pressure coefficient on the vertical axis, normalised time on the horizontal axis, and each of these three figures represents different building heights relative to the size of the vortex, and the lines represent the pressure distributions from different taps. And as you can see, that as we increase the building height from there to there to there, we have different pressure distributions, we have different behaviours. All we're doing is changing the height of the building relative to the vortex. So I'm going to get a red card fairly soon, so let me just move on to my general conclusions. That says downburst winds, but I think it should say transient winds. Transient winds can be simulated. There are a number of fundamental assumptions that we have to make in simulating them that I'm not happy with myself. There's a whole host of work that is needed in terms of what do we mean by scale. The flow is highly three-dimensional, more so than what we typically deal with. And our initial work actually indicates that the pressures that you get over these buildings, with all the caveats about scaling, um, result in pressures which are lower than atmospheric boundary layer type flows. Um, the height of the vortex with respect to the building is important. And if you'd like to borrow, steal any of the videos that I've shown you, they can be freely downloaded from that website there which is running into that header. Which if I just delete that. You should be able to see it now. Thank you very much. Any questions?